Okay, let's uh, let's get going for everyone that's here. We are now live on Facebook. Um, yeah, let's do this. Cool. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new Holix Live event. If you've never been here before, it is a part of a panel series that we are doing with publicists from around the music industry, all of whom use Holix, the music industry's premier promotional distribution platform. Now, the basic way to explain what we do at Holix is that we make it easy for people to securely and privately share new and unreleased music with tastemakers, members of the radio, or sometimes even members of their own band. It's used by everyone here today and many other people. If you want to try it out for yourself, go to holix.com that's h-a-u-l-i-x.com and we'd be glad to have you anyways my name is james shotwell and i am the director of customer engagement for holix as well as a music journalist and somebody that just loves talking to people about the business of music and everybody here on the panel today likes to talk about music and as i already said works in publicity so we're going to go around clockwise and let everyone introduce themselves starting with the one and only john asher john um, PR guy, um, based in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, um, pretty well known up here in these parts. Um, I take care of a lot of Canadian bands, uh, Canadian metal festivals. Um, yeah, you know, um, just doing all the press relations, everything, uh, read, heard, listened to. Um, scene, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I'm behind the scenes guy for that, for the bands and the labels and the festivals, and it goes on and on. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Ray? Um, I'm Ray Roldan, the president creator of Ravy Inc. Um, been doing this PR thing for about 25 years, I think. 25 years now, yeah. So, been over at Jive Records, at Silvertone. Um, Island Records, Island Def Jam, um, created a bunch of labels like Lost Highway Records, which was the uh, um, the Americana label. Actually, didn't create it, but I was one of the people who who were part of the the uh, the beginnings of it. Um, and uh, and yeah, like you know, Raby's been going on for as I mentioned, twenty five years. Um, actually, no, Raby's been going on for sixteen years. And uh, <laughs> we have everybody from like Ryan Key of Yellow Card to Engelbert Humperdinck to the Veronicas. To Diana Ross, um, just worked on, on uh, Mary J. Blige recently and a bunch of other stuff. So also a journalist too. And I've written something like 53 articles in the last four months for American Songwriter. So I mean, we're, not, we're talking features too, not just like little news stories, but features. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I don't know how you have that kind of time, but I admire it. I don't. And uh, <laughs> Jesse, why don't you finish us off? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I'm Jesse Lee. I'm co-owner of High Road Publicity. Um, we're a music PR firm that specializes in underground uh, emerging artists mostly. Um, I also curate some playlists. Uh, I dance on uh, TikTok, <laughs> kind of, <laughs> point the screen. Um, I played music all my life, guitars and sing. I was in bands, punk bands growing up. Um, got my start in the business side of things with Tragic Hero Records. I started there as a kind of like a PR intern, just gradually moved my way up and then started High Road in 2015. Fantastic. And we're going to get to your social media presence in a little bit. But first, I want to talk about something that Ray just mentioned, which is what you've been doing the last few months. Now, I know that it's a crazy time in the music business, and I feel like every single day I'm invited to a different panel to discuss the future of live entertainment and how the music industry is evolving. And I'm sure that we will talk about that today. But right now, I just want to know, like, how you're doing, like what's been going on the last few months. I know Ray, you are in New York, so I'm sure that you have a much different experience than John up in Canada where they have a sane leadership or Jesse who lives in the Cleveland area. So you're all from different parts of the world. I would love to know what your individual experiences have been like both, you know, just as people trying to survive and stay sane right now, as well as, you know, publicists trying to adjust to this changing landscape that we are now in right now. So why don't we just go in reverse order to start is the easiest way so jesse you want to kick us off with your insights from cleveland and the world of pr yeah i mean so things have been pretty crazy i've definitely thought that the um the shutdown was going to hurt the uh, at least my business personally um and i think initially it definitely did when everyone first got you know laid off and but like once the stimulus checks started coming in people started going back to work i think artists started realizing that they only thing they can do right now is release music. And then if you release music, you want it to be heard. So a lot of times you have to hire people to help you promote it and get it out there. 
so it's been pretty cool. It's been pretty steady and busy the last few months. Um, and aside from that, I mean, I just bought a house and moving in during a pandemic was pretty crazy. It was something I didn't really want to do, but I couldn't turn down the crazy low interest rates <laughs> right now. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, my life's been pretty, pretty wild. I got a kid too. So, you know, I'm trying to do the whole dad thing, family thing, adult thing, and run a business at the same time. It's been pretty nuts, but yeah, I, I definitely think, uh, it's, I'm, I'm not, I'm not as bummed about what I, I'm, I'm not as bummed as I thought it was going to be business-wise with the pandemic. It's definitely better than I thought it was going to be. It's not, I mean, I'm, I'm, of course I wish it was live music. That'd be, <laughs> that'd be great. <laughs> well, that's great, man. And, and I do, you do have our sympathies for being the only panelist today who has a small child at home with you. So you've been locked up with a very young child for the last few months. <laughs> it's, been, it's been interesting. <laughs> Ray, what's it, what's it been like in New York City, the place that's probably in the news the most often out of all of us? Well, um, New York has been kind of really bizarre because it went from like, you know, when I was, last time I was in the city was probably maybe like, maybe March, I think. I live only <laughs> one mile outside of New York City. So I look, when I look out my window, I see the skyline I see all the traffic on all the roads um, and everything. And it was really weird, like, you know, once the pandemic really um, happened and everything shut down, you didn't see traffic anymore. Um, and, uh, and it was just like really bizarre, you know, like um, from what I understand, like I drove through the city probably about a month and a half ago, just drove through it. Um, and it was completely dead. Like, you know, there's no people out really out there walking. Um, Times Square was, was abandoned. There's maybe three people in, this, in Times Square. Um, all the stores reported up, um, but yeah, it's been, it's been nuts. Um, and, uh, and so for us, I mean, we've been, I was really worried about um, what was going to happen with the pandemic. I thought that we were going to have to do furloughs, lay people off, that kind of thing. Cause I have a staff of about like five or six people. And, um, but we've been busier now than we actually have ever been. Um, I'm actually turning away business right now. Um, cause we're so, so freaking busy. And, and it's just like, it's, 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 it's been nuts. And one thing that I've been doing to kind of um, keep my mind off of the pandemic has been writing. You know, I, I, went, I was a journalist before I became a publicist. I used to write, write for um, Boston Globe. Um, you know, I started a bunch of magazines up in Boston, wrote for Details Magazine way back when. And, uh, and, and I kind of put that on the back burner when I became a publicist and then picked that back up again to kind of fill in those extra spots. So now, like, I, I write from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. pretty much every single night um, and write features for American Songwriter. Um, and that kind of keeps me as busy as possible, you know. So, um, but yeah, we've been really completely busy. It's been crazy. Can I ask Ray a question? Real yes. quick on that? <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, Ray, do you feel like you're more creative in those hours at 2 to 4 a.m.? Because I've really, I've read a lot of things that say like those twilight hours really, it kind of awakens like this different part of you. <laughs> That's how cheesy that sounds. But like, do you feel like you create better at those hours at night? Absolutely. I mean, seriously, after, after one o'clock in the morning, one o'clock is kind of like my, my twilight, if you will. Like I, I start to change. Um, I start, like I turn off the TV and that's when I listen. One to 2 a.m. is when I listen to music. Like I'll listen to new, like, you know, potential new projects that we're, we're considering. Um, and that, and then I have maybe two or three cups of coffee. And then by, by 2 a.m., it kind of kicks in. And I like, seriously, like that's between two and four is when I write best. You know, I can write three, three articles in, in uh, like three features in those, hour, in those two hours. We should study you. Like we should put you in a lab or something. <laughs> but I agree. I get, uh, I, I have some nights where it's like at 10, 11, I get this boost of energy. And it's like, I can write all my news releases, like really like bam, 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 or answer emails. And I just, I'm more, I'm more concentrated at night than I am during the day when like the, the phone is going blitzed and every, and emails, it's just, it's, it's quieter a bit, right? At night, so mm -hmm. no, no, not as many distractions, but at night, sometimes my mind, even when I go to bed, I'm lying in bed and I'm like, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i can't relate to these comments at all i feel like i haven't written a thing that i've flat out enjoyed in uh probably like three weeks I, i've written things don't don't get me wrong but i have uh not successfully written many things that i'm like this is good i always just wake up the next day being like what did i do what is this i seriously feel uh, that if i get more than more than like four or five hours of sleep per night um i'm junk the next day you know, oh. 
<laughs> I, I've tried mm-hmm. sleeping, getting eight hours of sleep. And when, when I wake up the next morning, I'm just completely exhausted. But if I have like three mm. or four hours of sleep, like in the next morning, I'm ready to go. You know, seriously, one cup of coffee, I'm, I'm, I'm off, you know? Oh, that's, you're a lucky, you're a lucky person. I'm at like seven hours of sleep a night and then just dragging. But we also like, we, I don't know how all of your workflows are and we could get into that in a second. But for me, my work day is usually like I wake up and then I I have emails to answer from like Europe or somewhere, do that. And then, then I get around to coffee and things like that. So I'm not really waking up and then like settling into the flow of the day. I'm like waking up and rushing to get into things that I I have happened overnight. And then by the time I catch my breath, I'm like, I don't, I don't even want to create anymore necessarily. I just churning things out so uh, i'm that's that leads us to a good place to go next you know what what has your work-life balance ray i don't know if you have much balance in what you're describing but how is balancing work and life going i mean generally speaking for publicists it's always assumed that you don't have much life outside of what you do for work so i'm curious has this pandemic thrown your schedule of your day out of whack or have you is it pretty much the same as it was in march well um, my day has been pretty much um, just as crazy. I mean, it's always been crazy. Um, mm-hmm. but, but yeah, like, you know, balancing has been, has, has been tough, you know, like trying to figure out, like try to find time to go food shopping when stores usually close back around eight or nine o'clock now um, instead of midnight like they used to and having to take mm-hmm. time out of, out of work, like, you know, that consider work time, you know? So, but yeah, I, mean, I don't know. What about you guys? I found it to be, um, it's been like a mini vacation because in a sense, like I'm kind of lost because I, I used to like summer times was like I'm, I'm on the road too with, with the festivals I work for in Canada and some bands I like to hit the road on tour with them and go on road trips. And it's or and, and in Montreal, it's like we got a huge metal scene here. There's so many venues and so many bands. So it would be like work, work, work. All right. Eight, nine o'clock get ready let's go to the venue stay out till one two in the morning come home wake up eight nine start work again and you know so i was used to going to shows four times a week at least right you know Mm -hmm. um and then that's that's just gone so it's just like i sometimes feel weird when i'm like i call it quits at like eight nine ten o'clock at night (laughs) and just be like what do i do now (laughs) <laughs> I go and I walk my dog. I come home, have a late dinner, and then veg for a bit, and then that's it. But like, there's, there's, it's, it's just different. And but going back to also to the first question, it was like when, uh, when everything happened, when the pandemic happened, a lot of bands I felt started pulling out. Right, they were just like, oh shit, no, 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 we sh- shouldn't release. And what I noticed on Holix was a huge surge on downloads in mm-hmm. uh, April, was it? Yeah, March, April, May, June, whatever. There was like this huge surge and some bands were like, oh, it's not a good time to release. And I'm actually was like, it's a really good time to release. More people are paying attention. The media guys who have full-time jobs are at home right now covering <laughs> more content for their websites, right? And the radio guys in their uh, the radio and Spotify and all that, all that. And um, so I think some bands missed out because some bands were like, screw it. And we're not releasing anything till this pandemic's over. But uh, a lot of people are looking for new music, new distractions, all that stuff. So it is good. And then like, Ray, I suddenly, I found like June, July is my touring season, my festival. So I had this void. What am I like? You know, I had to do all the retraction stuff for all the festivals Mm. and everything. But um, as soon as bands realize, like, this is going to be a while, they're starting to put music out again. And it's been a surge. Uh, The last few months have just been, like, constant everyday um, inquiries for PR. And we got this album and we want to release it. You know, it's just you're doing everything but playing live right now. So mm. there's nothing wrong with that. People need stuff, you know, mm. to get excited about. So besides that, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, J- uh, Jesse, yeah, what's I, your life been like? <laughs> oh, man. Um, 
it's, it's wild. <laughs> I usually start my days about 5 a.m. Um, and I try to get, uh, probably, probably when Ray's just going to bed, I'm, I'm getting up. Um, so yeah, I usually start around like 5 a.m. Um, and try to get caught up on work before the baby wakes up. Um, then the baby gets up and, you know, do that whole rigmarole of like feeding and diapers, blah, 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 breakfast. And then it just depends on if my wife's home that day or if she's at work because she's an ER nurse. So she's, you know, out there 12 hour shifts doing that thing. So sometimes it's like I'm on dad duty the whole day by myself. So I'm trying to like write press releases while he's, you know, running around and wants me to play with him. <laughs> so that can be tough to juggle sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's it's just generally a, a balance of like working and being a dad most of the day until he goes to bed. And then, you know, at night I work again until probably about, you know, about 11 o'clock midnight and then try to hopefully fall asleep sometime there. But it was like John says, like sometimes you're laying in bed, you're like, you can get an idea of like a hook or something you could use and for a, a feature or something like that. You're like, oh, that's great. I got, I got to work that up somehow. <laughs> you know, you get out of your bed and you start writing shit. So I, mean, it's like, it's weird. Cause like, I never had, a super strict schedule before the pandemic because you know I work from home and you know I have a baby and stuff but without being able to take the kid anywhere for a few hours like to get out of the house it makes it even less of a schedule I guess <laughs> you know it's even more like <laughs> while everything is different you know um so yeah I mean it's it's uh it hasn't changed too much but it's it's I think it's definitely a little more chaotic well, I mean, you got a lot. You got a lot going on. Like, I, I do want to talk a little bit about new things that we're getting into now. Right? You've already told us about your writing. You do a lot with American Songwriter, which is, I guess, we should probably plug where some of those features run, and uh, your work's really great there. But for everyone else, what have what have you been getting into? Like, do you have any new hobbies emerging with this extra time? Because I'm like you guys. I I go to shows three to four nights a week, and I think on. I went to a couple of drive-in shows, but by September 10th, I'll be at six wow. months without like a proper concert. So like, what have you guys been getting into? I, I want to start with Jesse because he, uh, he's become TikTok popular, which is, which is an <laughs> interesting feat that kind of ties into uh, publicity that we can talk about a little bit later. But Jesse, let's start with you because you recently crossed 50,000 followers on TikTok as like a full grown adult publicist father. So who, who posts videos about the alternative and metal scene. So like, can you talk a little bit about your journey in TikTok to kick us off? Yeah. I mean, when, you know, when TikTok started kind of becoming more of a, a trendy thing for people to discover, discover music, I was like, anytime a new technology comes out or a new app or new social media comes out, like my first instinct is to embrace it because I never want to be the person that's like, oh, that's for kids, you know, because we're trying to reach kids at the end of the day, you know, kids buy music, you know, <laughs> so I want to like, you know, I want to embrace whatever the new thing is out there. I never want to be the old fuddy-duddy that doesn't want to grow or whatever. Um, so anyway, yeah, I just, I got on it and dude, I, I lurked on that app for probably months before I even created anything, just like watching the trends, seeing what worked, seeing what didn't work. And like, I made a few videos and they didn't do anything, you know? Um, and then like, I just found a weird niche where like, I, you know, just suggest music to people, which is insane because that's literally what I do all day long for a job is suggest music to people. And it turns out people on TikTok like that too. <laughs> yeah. I never would have thought that would be a thing, especially the alternative like scene crowd, because like, that's like such a small circle, you know, compared to like all the Cardi B and uh, the weekend type stuff that's usually filtering on that app. Um, but there is a, there is a small subset of people and when I say small, there's still like, it's still like millions of people, but it's a smaller group of people that really do love alternative music, heavy music, like metalcore, indie, all that stuff. And it was cool that I found a little circle that I can kind of like help out my clients and also just expose music that I really love. I mean, I do promote my clients on there, but I promote a lot of bands on that I don't work with just because I think they're great, you know, or if somebody hits me up and they're like, oh, I want to, I have a new song coming out, can you put, put it on your TikTok? Like they don't, have to pay me for that i'll put it up there you know if it's a good song like it's the same thing with the you know the, the playlist i curate like i know a lot of curious charge for placements and stuff and i mean that's super against spotify's um terms and i definitely don't charge for it if a band makes a great song wants to be on my playlist i'll put them on there you know i'm not gonna make them jump through hoops or anything like that um mm. so yeah uh, that's basically that's how i got started doing the tiktok thing I was just trying to because i thought it was going to be something that was going to be valuable for you know my clients and I, I felt like it was the next wave, which I think it is, um, as, long as, as long as it doesn't get banned <laughs> anytime soon. Um, it's okay. Yeah. You'll have the memories. 
Right, right. <laughs> John, what about you? Have you gotten into any new hobbies in the last few months? Hard to like. I go with my dog. That's been my hobby. <laughs> Honestly, um, I just, I've been working. I, I just work doing the regular things I've been doing. And my only socialization out outdoors is I just walk a lot. I walk the dog. I call, I, well, I've been calling it park days this summer. That's all it's been. It's like, I walk the dog in the morning, go to the park, finish work at night, walk the dog, go to the park, throw, throw some toys, you know, um, yeah. been on a diet. I've lost about <laughs> um Look at you. No, extra, no extra hobbies really and then uh you know COVID's not as bad as it is in the states right now so i've been able to uh uh unfortunately it's in montreal some there's we just passed that like venues could host 250 people uh but you know those venues still lose money money opening up so i don't know what's going to happen um but little shows are slowly going to be coming up in the next month or so um so we'll see what happens with that um but honestly yeah and yeah no not much and then like you, you do bonfires at people's houses um you know uh, that's all you're allowed because <laughs> like because <laughs> um going to the businesses you, you got to wear your face masks and then when you get inside uh the bars or the restaurants you're allowed once you're at the table but um it's a little frustrating right um yeah so you're better off just ho hosting your own shindig i'm surprised mm -hmm. i haven't heard of any underground shows going on um especially in the punk scene or something um a little rebellious um but no nothing none of that so mm -hmm. no new hobbies for me <laughs> <laughs> well, I do want to talk a little bit about shows, bringing it back to the world of PR. You know, there was the there was the flood of the at home concert experience in like March and April. People were playing acoustic and stripped down shows, and everyone was you know tuning in on Instagram Live. But over the last four to eight weeks, we really saw the evolution of it happen pretty quickly. Where now bands are starting to be charging money for these very intricate well-planned well-staged live stream performances i know earlier today my partner and i we bought a pass to watch bjork perform next month um and we paid like 60 dollars to watch three concerts so people are making money on this i'm curious how your artists have all been kind of adapting if they're embracing the world of live streaming if they're if they're expressing interest to you and i kind of want to start with ray because you you're your catalog of artists spans a lot of time. Like you have Engelbert, who I know is doing a lot, just did a live stream event. And you work with artists like Bauhaus and people who have a little bit, who are a little bit older. And I'm curious what it's like to see them ad adapting to this digital age. Are they embracing it with open arms? Are they quick to it? Or is, is there a little bit of a learning curve? Well, it's interesting because Engelbert, like Engelbert Humperdinck is, is 85 years old, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, and he's been, and, and his audience is mostly, you know, grandmothers and, and like, you know, and people like 50 years old and older. And, and so like, we thought, like, I was kind of a little concerned that if he did a live stream concert, he wouldn't really get that many, many, many viewers. And he did this, his very first live stream concert, what was it about maybe two or three weeks ago? And mm -hmm. like, you know, so far it's racked up almost 350,000 views. You know, um, he had a few, like he had, a, I think, I want to say like 20, 30,000 people engaged when it was happening, you know, so wow. um, it was, it's, it, that's been kind of crazy seeing that learning curve, you know, and, and, uh, and he picked up on it really quickly, you know, when he started seeing that he could chat with people in, in real time, he started mm -hmm. wanting, he wanted to do more chats, you know, again, mm -hmm. this is like an 85 year old guy. And so it's really kind of interesting. Um, Gloria Gaynor, who I work with as well. She hasn't really done any concerts, um, but what she ended up doing was she partnered up with um, the head chef of Carmine's, um, the really big restaurant here in the city. Like, and, uh, and now they're doing cooking shows, you know, and her audience is, is pretty much the disco era and, and, and beyond. So, um, so, th so she's been actually doing these cooking shows on, on uh, you know, on Instagram Live that actually have been, do have, have been really, really great. Um, and, and yeah, and then a lot of my other artists are doing these concerts, you know, Enter Shikari, I've been doing a bunch of concerts, like, you know, a bunch of shows um, from, from, from their vantage point. Um, and, uh, but yeah, like, you know, these, these, uh, these living room concerts, like, you know, the, the living room shows, the sessions, 
but like I'm glad that we're kind of over that. You know, the the sat mm -hmm. is so saturated because they they all look so terrible. And I would say about like seventy percent <laughs> sound terrible too. Um, yeah, yeah. I love the fact that actually people are getting creative. Um, I had the sounds do a concert in in Malmo, Sweden. They closed off the uh, the venue and and just performed a concert. Put put that concert live free on YouTube, and it went really really well. Alien Ant Farm did the same thing from um, from the Troubadour in LA just not that long ago. Mm. And so those mm. concerts have seemed to be like, you know, to be picking up. And as you mentioned, some of them are, are, are starting to charge, like Alien Ant Farm did charge for their concert, you know, and mm. uh, that went really, really well. So mm. I think like, you know, the, that, like, you know, that live show kind of thing is, is really starting to pick up and, and, and they're doing it in a much better, much more, um, uh, I guess, like audience friendly way in which like, you know, the, the audience can really hear much better. Like the audio quality has just gotten better. You know, the visuals have gotten better. People are getting more creative and I, and, and mm. I, I enjoy that evolution. I think it's been great. Yeah. I, I saw today that the Engelbert event has almost 300,000 views on YouTube, which is like a massive, it would be a massive success for anybody. So like go him at 85 years old. Yeah. <laughs> And, and I even I'll even add that I, I've really enjoyed seeing some artists pull concerts out of their vault. I know that Knotfest has been promoting a lot of metal shows that are like previously recorded, but I, I think Reba McIntyre a few weeks ago put up a 90s concert film that she had made and maybe put out on VHS and then was never seen again. And she put it on YouTube as like a live stream event and had, you know, 30,000 people watching simultaneously. That was like a really cool thing to see people do. Now, Jesse and John, you work with artists of all sizes and a lot of like artists that are still on the come up on the rise or just under the radar and you're helping them reach that next level of success. Are any of them embracing the world of live streaming in, in a way that you think is really cool or interesting? Some are, um, <laughs> some not. Uh, I, 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 personally, you know, I feel like the live stream is going to be a fad. And for like, for for an indie artist, it it works only if the demand is there, right? So bands who are just starting out, it's not. It, if you're content with 10, 15, 20, 50 people watching you and do it um exposure is exposure um but you know it, it just comes do you feel it's it's worth it right i have some bands who, who've done it and i say just do a q a and it's just a way to get a one-on-one -on -one with fans and stuff so there's nothing wrong with it i think what's going to happen eventually is people will get tired of the live streams like i personally my personal thoughts is i don't Feel it's worth paying for somebody to, to see on my my computer screen uh i'm bored i'm i for me that's just me as a fan it's it's boring for me you know i can mm -hmm. walk away click it it's just it it's no live experience um for those who for the diehard fans then it's great you know i have i work with anonymous who are been around for like 30 years in canada we're thrash legends here and we're doing a live stream in two weeks uh out of quebec city and we're charging for that and we're going to see how that goes uh i helped with the anvil one that went down uh a while back what i like i do i, I do like about the live streams is it, instead of like a, a, it's a touring show right you just get those people mm -hmm. in the city you have a broad international audience you can bring you can funnel mm -hmm. it together right to 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 expose the band right so that that kind of works um so that's my take on live streaming but i, I do suggest it if the bands want to do it um on their facebook live or, or instagram or whatever um then do it like you you know especially if you're a small band you, you got to build up the ladder so it starts with small small numbers and building and building and building and building so go for it but if uh, if the band thinks they're going to do a live stream and they have a publicist and, you know, they're going to get a thousand people tuned in or 2,000, 100,000, uh, the demand's not there, right? So just, just <laughs> realize that too, right? Like your band only has a thousand likes, 10% is really paying attention to your Facebook anyway. So it's like, mm. what are you, you know, but do it, engage those because you have super fans too. People who, who, that one fan who, who will drop a hundred, two hundred bucks on merch, right? 
still and so yeah and they just love your band so mm-hmm. target those to the super fan interesting thing to that um, john though um i had a band who is nobody knows you know it's like at least at least out, outside of australia it's a band called the buckley's you know they're they're a country band um and they're teenagers they're three teenagers and they and we we set up a uh, um a virtual concert tour for them in which we did um a concert in for for the northeast um like new york new jersey or whatever boston like you know that that area we did like four we split the, the north america into four different um areas and then and and when we got done with those four concerts they had they had actually been seen by 350,000 people you know it was crazy it was insane so then we thought we thought like you know well if we if we can get 350,000 people for, to to walk to tune into this this unknown band do a live stream concert and it was a 45 minute concert it wasn't even just like three songs it was it was like pretty much a full set for them we went we did a um, a worldwide concert we did asia we did um eastern europe europe we did western europe um like india all those again like, and we went and we did a, a home show back in australia and to date now we've actually amassed 4.5 million of an audience for a band that like the, their debut album isn't even out yet it comes out next month and uh and so we're using that that surge from the, the, their live stream concerts um to kind of build up their story and it's been it's been kind of fascinating to watch it somebody's like a band that nobody knows um people tuned into like 4.5 million people access these concerts you know? well that's pretty good for country yeah yeah and for some band that nobody knows you know yeah absolutely um i think what's, my- the, name? what's the band's name yeah buckley's <laughs> the buckley's the Bu- okay uh jesse what were you gonna say oh um i was gonna say i think the best like creative uh approach i've seen to bands doing this as far as like an unknown like, emerging band scale um there's this band i worked with called uh shakeout they're a, a duo that they loop they use looping pedals and stuff they're a punk kind of alternative um and what they've been doing is they've been doing twitch streams of all their band practices um and the thing is the two have really great personalities so in between songs they're you know, if you've ever been at band practice, you know how it is. You play a song and then you bullshit with your bandmates for a few minutes and make jokes and stuff. So what they've been doing is they've been tw- Twitch streaming all these like concert or these uh, band practices every night and people are watching those and they're chopping up the parts, the in-between parts. So they're like little skits, if you want to call them that. And they're putting those up on TikTok and they've got like 12,000 followers on TikTok already, which is like crazy for a band no one knows to have followers on TikTok. Because like, like we said before, it's hard for alternative music to break through on there. But they're bringing people to their page with their funny little like personalities and skits and stuff. And then in turn, these people are discovering their music through that. And they're watching the, the Twitch stream. Like, I mean, they're not probably making money or getting famous off this yet. But it's a really creative way to do this streaming that I, I haven't seen anyone else do yet, where they're actually like they're repurposing this content that band practice isn't usually content. You know, you usually aren't able to do something with that, but they found a way to make that content. And then, like I said, repurpose it twice and get on another platform. I think it's pretty cool. I, I haven't seen anyone else like kind of pull that off yet. Yeah, I think uh, Mark Rebelais does something, has kind of found his career doing something similar with like live broadcasts and just kind of being a silly personality that people like, where he doesn't necessarily even have to release music as long as he does like these regular live streams. He can sell tickets to events and, you know, build an audience around you know, being the so-called loop daddy, like people, yeah. people like that people take an interest in what he's doing. That's, that's pretty fun. I, I'm curious, John, you mentioned, you know, kind of feeling like this is, is a passing fad. And I'm curious how the rest of you feel about that earlier today. In fact, I was watching a panel from billboard where, you know, they have top talk, people talking about the future of live entertainment and somebody suggested, you know, an artist, if you're an artist that can sell at the Staples center, for example, at $150 a ticket, that's a really nice payday. Now, if you could also add 30,000 digital tickets for $50 a pop and people could watch the concert as it's happening from, you know, another country or somewhere where maybe that artist is unable to tour, then you could, you know, double down on how much money you're making from a single event. So why wouldn't we continue to integrate live streaming once live music resumes, just because there's going to be that demand. And also, you know, there's the idea that 
just because they're like, we can have a concert doesn't mean that people are going to feel safe to go, go to that concert or, you know, be around people just yet. So there might be a little bit of an opportunity to cash in on those who are like, I want to go to a concert, but I'm not ready to go back into public just yet. So I'll pay a little bit of money to see other people attend a concert. And then you get the advantage of having the crowd there and maybe the energy of the event will change. Something that I come back to a lot is whether or not the quality can be maintained. I mean, as somebody that has already started paying for these events, I, I've already, I've very quickly gotten to be to the point where I catch myself being snobby while where I'll watch a paid live stream and be like, oh no, this sound quality is pretty bunk for paying $10. <laughs> just like if you go to a concert and you see a band you love, but, but the, it's like, it's muffled. You're just like, come on guys. Like this is all you had to do was this one event. Um, so, and the idea of like taking, taking the live thing on, on the roads seems difficult to me in terms of like you know, guaranteeing a certain level of quality. Nobody wants to pay to watch, you know, what amounts to a, a camcorder live stream of a show, or maybe people do, I don't know. But thinking about the future in a magical world where we have concerts again, do, you, do, you, do, the, do the other two of you, Jesse and Ray, do you see live streaming being something that you continue to work into PR packages when you're talking to bands and ideas that you discuss with them, or do you think it's gonna go the way of the Buffalo? Um, so I, I think, uh... I don't think I'll be really hands-on with like the live streaming organization of that, but I think bands will definitely, like you said, at least initially, before, when everyone starts dipping their toes back into the live music scene, I think it will, it will be a big part for a while. I do agree with John. I think it is a fad. I think people have gotten over it a little bit to the point where like everybody's doing one. Every time I hear about one, I'm like, yeah, okay. Like, like it's a band I would go pay C live anyway. Cause if not, I'm probably not going to go see the live stream, you know? <laughs> like, so it's like, mm -hmm. I have to like really want to really be into the band and want to watch them on my computer really, you know, cause I mean, we all know how it is. Like it's cool, but at the same time, you're like, it's not the same energy, you know, it's like you're sitting at home on your couch you, know, you might be drinking a beer and trying to like rock out, pretend you're at a concert, but it's not the same like energy as being at a show. Um, but yeah, I do agree. I think it'll be around for a while just out of necessity um and then once it does get back full swing and everyone's super comfy cozy going to shows again i could definitely see venues still wanting to offer it just because like you said it's extra revenue why not but i i, I can't imagine people would want to continue doing that because you'll just you'll probably be like oh, i'll just catch them when they're in my town like if they're not coming to your town then maybe that's probably the only way you diehard fans they're gonna add it i think what's gonna happen is like they're gonna add the live stream mm -hmm for the diehard bands. Well, they were kind of doing this before anyways. You could, like, what bands were, you know, some of the big bands were touring, and if you wanted to tune in on that show, you could pay to see them anyways, performing from that city. So, you know, it could be that you're conditioning the people now. People are going to be more conditioned psychologically to be like, oh, it's live streaming. Oh, I could do this. You know, like, maybe that might happen, right? when touring yeah. starts to pick up again but like yeah yeah i don't know i'm really like i really fucking hate live stream <laughs> like oh. like the metallica thing is like i'm gonna drive to a drive-in i heard actually let me rewind i was hanging with a buddy who came in from uh from toronto and he told me about the doro thing in europe and it's like mm -hmm. you go to this cinema like you go to the what should we call it the movie the driving theaters yep and she's performing on a stage or was performing on a stage but like it's crystal clear audio radio to your car radio right so it's like you don't even get the live sound you know it was just like a record practically right. on your car you yeah. can't leave the car so it's mm -hmm. it's just I don't know. I have a hard time with this. This is not a concert experience. And to me, it's stupid. I know I shouldn't be saying this stuff in the industry, right? I'm a publicist and all. But my personal thoughts is if I can't pay to see you on a stage and feel the vibe of the whole uh, venue, everybody there and, you know, the moshing and the, the roaring and, the, uh, you know, then fuck it. I'll just wait. Uh, <laughs> right. You know? Like, yeah, oh, well, wow. I, like, I don't know. I don't want to, I just, I, I just, I, I'm, ha it's a, for me as a fan going to live concerts a lot. It's just, it's a, it's an inner struggle. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I've been asked, do you want to go watch? No. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> I'm, 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 
you know, it's, it's just, it's not the same. Right. And I think everybody will agree. It's just not the same. So I don't yeah. know. And I think that the Metallica one is kind of interesting because, you know, Garth Brooks did the live concert drive and event thing too. And he sold like 150,000 tickets in two hours or something ridiculous, but he did perform live while people watched. So if there were mistakes or whatever, they saw that, but the, the Metallica one, they're recording it like this week and then mixing and mastering the audio and then it'll be shown in theater. So it's really just a, a concert film performed to nobody, which is kind of makes it like, a, it's just a different it is a very Metallica way to handle this this time in our lives. Um, Ray, what what are your thoughts about the future of live streaming? Well, I think like you know, coming from a different direction, actually, um, talking to the journalists, like you know, a lot of the journalists that I deal with from like from like the New York Times, from like a few of the writers from Rolling Stone, um, and those like you know those people who they're actually like, you know many of them are older, you know, many of them are in their mm -hmm. 50s and 60s years old, um, who will go to concerts because they're on assignment. Um, this is before pandemic. And like, you know, and, and they didn't always enjoy it because at their age, like, you know, they like, you know, they have to stand far away from the stage if it's more of a rock show. With these live streams, they, um, they're they able actually to review the shows and kind of like, mm -hmm. and do it in that, in, in a much more methodical um, crit critique heavy kind of way. And I think that's actually important for, for like, you know, there's two sides to that. I think it's important for for these writers to be able to um, talk, like you know, and criti criticize it, criticize the concerts properly and fairly by watching these concerts in that that way, um, because they're not being spilled on, because they're not getting jostled around, because people aren't going up to them, annoying them, saying, "Oh, you're writing? Who you're writing for?" You know that kind of stuff that I see all the time with these writers. Um, the other part of it is the fact that since these writers are reviewing a live concert. And they're able to re rewind and, and watch it over again. They're losing the spontaneity of the live concert, you know. Um, so when they're writing about it, they may not actually have that, like you know, as, as you were saying, John, like you know, the the atmosphere of that elect, like you know, the the crowd electricity, you know, that kind of thing. So it's it's so it's coming from a different angle. But from the writer's I, the writer's point of view, I think a lot of times, like you know, being able to review it in that kind of way is helpful for them. Um, me, I mm. love I love live shows. I mean, I go to I, I used to go to you know five to ten a week um, in the city all the time. Um, <laughs> but like at the same time, like I also kind of see the value in a lot of these concerts for some of these audience members who are handicapped, you know, or who are suffer from um, from claustrophobia. I know a lot of friends of mine who don't go to concerts like they, they don't go to those concerts because of the fact that they suffer from claustrophobia and they enjoy being able to watch it from this way, from the, this, this, this uh, vantage point. And I think that's important to consider, you know, um, I think it's actually a very, like with mental health being such a big part of the discussion now, being able to take into account their experiences to, of seeing these live concerts now that they've never been able to see before is important. And I, and I love mm -hmm. them. I love that, that, that ability for them to be able to experience these things that, that all of us take for granted. You know, um, mm. so I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword for a lot of people. Um, and I agree that the, um, that like, you know, the, like, you know, the, the whole excitement about these, these, uh, these live stream concerts is starting to wane. Um, but I think it's going to be here to stay, especially with the pandemics of, you know, with people saying that coronavirus isn't going to go away. You know, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be scared about going to concerts, um, who are going to be scared about being, being in, 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 like in, in that contact. This gives them the option to 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 experience it a different way, you know. I think it's mm. uh, I think it's important to have that option. Yeah, I actually read a live stream review recently. The problem is, is that not not all these events end up being available after the fact, so that, that that's like something we have to kind of figure out to come to grips with. Because I hate reading a live. It's like it was the greatest live stream I've ever seen, and then you're like, but you you can't see it anymore. Sorry, <laughs> just so you know, it's it's. Yeah, it's it's a weird new kind of rarity. Like, like you saw it and then it's, you it's gone for pay it. into it, right? Yeah, or at least at least put it up after the fact for a lesser amount of money because I'm okay with that, that too. Like uh, a promoter did that for Anvil. He played it once. They did the actual live stream and then he's like, "Oh, we're gonna do a rebroadcast," but you had to pay for the rebroadcast, right? So it was like, mm -hmm. uh, and the diehard Anvil fans were like, "Yeah." Oh my God, we're gonna pay. They paid like thirty. I don't remember what they paid. It was just ridiculous. Um, <laughs> but uh, we got it out there. I still did my job. I got it out there. You know, we got it out to all the metal outlets to, to pump up and stuff. So, um, mm. but when Ray was talking, it made me feel like you know, 
these live streams for the reviewers. It's just like, man, I might as well just put it on a, a, on a file and just email it to you then. Like, <laughs> here, we, I would we, be okay with that. Put as it as part of the PR campaign. Here's the live stream, you know, part of the promo campaign of the album. We're going to service you the videos. I don't know. I don't know. I've been pretty like, oh, diehard fan in me is like dying with these live streams. <laughs> but, well, like, sorry, but, you, know, is like... you know, and it's also for sorry. like, get yeah, it. Bands are losing income. So, yeah, you got to do these two, right? Um, yeah. To engage the people. And it's also brand awareness. They are good for the brand awareness. It keeps the momentum, you know, of the brand keep going. It's a reminder hey, we're still kicking, you know, we're not dead. All that stuff. So check us out. Mm. Look at me. I'm stupid. Super- so, so yeah. Well, well I was going to say, go ahead. I was going to say, just one thing that worries me about though is like how we, you know, no one like really buys music anymore. Everyone streams music and, you know, you'll buy the vinyl maybe, but the general population doesn't value physical music the way they used to. And I worry because like, live music was the last kind of avenue where people you still had to go you had to get out of your house and go there buy a ticket and watch the show and like if we lose that then it's like damn like is there any value to <laughs> music anymore because it's just it's all out there now it's all completely free like there's no like i mean yeah at least if they're paying for the the live stream at least the artists get something but yeah when it gets to the point where it's like i mean how how far are we going to be away from technology where it's like oh i want to see fucking Bono play a show and like you you flip a switch in your head and also it projects on the screen in front of you or something like mm. some crazy black mirror shit. Who's you know? gonna come up with that, man? Yeah, exactly. You know, like, boom. Actually, I wanted to ask James, use something. You've been posting a lot of things on the live stream uh, revenues. Yeah. Right? So I, I wouldn't mind hearing everybody's take on this because like I got a band who asked me yesterday, they're like, should we even bother anymore with these Spotify's and this shit? The payouts, such shit. Maybe we should mm-hmm. just direct them where we make the most money. And they're like, maybe we should just do one. Let's just funnel them all to a band camp. Fuck Apple. Mm-hmm. Fuck, fuck, fuck them all. Just, <laughs> you know. And I, I don't know. My opinion was, yeah, it's a loss, but you need, you need to be seen and heard everywhere. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's the answer, but I, I will say that the, the problem with the idea that we should all run to Bandcamp is that Bandcamp is <laughs> treading on very thin ice about whether or not they should have to pay royalties for streaming that yeah. will inevitably break if everyone starts to put their content there. Because, because you know, major labels have always been a holdout to Bandcamp. I mean, some of them have joined on or at least some imprint labels. I know like, uh, like uh, Death Row Records entire catalog is on Bandcamp now. Like you can buy a Tupac album on Bandcamp if you want. But all the majors are holding off because you can't make any money off those streams. But if everyone starts to run there, that that's going to be a loss because Bandcamp insists they're not a streaming platform. But, uh, you know, a lot of people do. Yeah, I get it. But yeah. I wanted to know uh, what you guys take on it because, like, I, I'm having, you know, there's been some backlash on Spotify, right? Floating around on the social media and all that stuff. And, you know, the only bands who are happy are the, the multi million dollar ones, right? So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of always the case. So it seems like in the music industry, <laughs> like, people are only the people at the top are ever satisfied with what they're getting, it feels like. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, Spotify, yeah, there's no secret. It doesn't pay very well. You know, if, if they paid every artist a penny per stream, they'd go bankrupt in uh, an hour, you know, because like, it, it would just it wouldn't physically happen. I mean, the only thing that I can say is like the, the amount of possibility for music discovery on places like Spotify and Apple Music is insane. Like you can you can so many bands have broken big just from, you know, get on the right playlists and write algorithms and stuff because they and they've blown up because you know a lot of people not obviously not playlists aren't the end all be all of course but like it can help get you to new years i mean just as a fan i've discovered so much music through like spotify and you know obviously youtube too you know the suggested videos that pop up after you watch something um i mean it's it's weird like the algorithm a lot of time knows you better than you know yourself <laughs> it'll suggest a song like oh shit that's a good tune all right and the phones are listening to us oh yeah 100%, yeah <laughs> <laughs> um well if if you have something to pop in ray you can but i do we have a we have a bunch of questions so i want to try to get to a couple before i have to let you all go um all right let's do it let's dive into it uh 
starting starting with you, Ray, because you're somebody for everyone that's watching that's unfamiliar with Ray. He we could he has a billion stories to tell that could fill up a whole hour in and of itself. But one of my favorite things that Ray has done for the last few years is that he maintains a blog where he captures interactions that he has with people. And if you know him on social media, he captures some of the emails that he sent as a publicist all the time that are the most surprising, infuriating, silly, whatever. So somebody uh, in the chat on Facebook, actually, Ray, wanted to know if you've had, especially since the pandemic started, what's been the most kind of wild email exchange that you've had with the person in the media? Uh, it's been actually, a lot of those conversations have cut down quite a bit because normally like they're asking for tickets or photo passes or shit like that. Uh, but since the pandemic, uh, something happened recently in which somebody claimed that um, I owed them money because they had bought tickets to a Bauhaus show at Radio City Music Hall and the concert was canceled, you know. Um, and I had to explain to them that I'm not the booking agent and everything like that. And so she demanded that I send her a check um, for $78 and she gave, sent me her address and she even sent me her, her credit card information. <laughs> you know, so like her bank information, so I can actually send an ACH to her. Um, so I had to explain to her that that it, like I wasn't the right person, but that I was going to send, I was going to screenshot her info and put it up on on Reddit. So, <laughs> but she, but wow. yeah, you know, those conversations have cut down considerably because no, cause nobody's asking for tickets to concerts. <laughs> well, I mean, you might start getting live stream ticket requests soon, so don't <laughs> knock on wood right now. Um, all right, let's move on to a question for everybody in the group because uh, there are several in here and I would like to get to a couple of them before we get too far. Um, we, we've kind of touched on this already, but has have there been any emerging trends other than live streams that you found really working in terms of raising your artist profile or raising engagement for their content as we've gotten into the pandemic? I know some people have gone to Twitch, people have gone to Instagram, some people have gone to Patreon. Uh, you know, Cardi B recently signed up for OnlyFans. There are a ton of different ways that people are starting to try to get their word out there and different kind of partnerships with blogs or even, you know, going away from blogs and embracing podcasting and YouTube. So, if we could just kind of go around, what, what's been you know the most successful or even most surprising trend in terms of getting people to care about an artist's story in this time? You want me to go? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, go for it. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it's not really surprising, but I think the thing I've seen work best is just uh, content creation, like the artists themselves becoming content creators. Uh, I mean, that's obviously what they've always been doing anyway by creating music, but now they're starting to be the influencers themselves like they're creating a podcast and they're doing you know vlogging where they're actually just like a day in the life of a musician or whatever it is like i think or like starting like like with that band I mentioned earlier shake out where they have those little skits they do in between like anything that's like is more entertainment based and provides value because like when it comes to social media like i feel like you really have to either do one or two things you either have to educate or entertain uh if you can figure mm -hmm. out both and you're you're on fire you know <laughs> but i think um, if you do one of those two things on social media to draw attention to yourself, that's going to make them stick around and be like, oh, what else do you do? Oh, you make music? Like a lot of bands I've seen um, do something really well is uh, if, if someone in the band is a producer showing the creation of music and mashups and how they produce music and stuff. Because a lot there's a lot of techie people out there that like, really nerd out on that kind of stuff to get interested. And if they're on the page long enough watching that stuff, they're going to start listening to the music that you're playing as well and then get into that and find the band that way. So I think, yeah, just generally finding a creative way to promote yourself without outwardly promoting yourself is the, the best thing I've seen bands do lately. Uh, using a secondary to get to the primary, mm -hmm. right? Uh, mm -hmm. Show people that you have other interests besides, hey, listen to my music. Hey, listen to me. Let's cl it's I call it the Mad TV Stewart effect. A lot of people... <laughs> It's look at me, mm -hmm. look what I can do, look what I can do. And they forget, like, show other sides of you, of the band, mm -hmm. the artists themselves, and and what what you like that also comes, what inspires you to make the music you make, you know? A lot of bands forget that. Like, I ask them, I have, like, a, before I work with a band, I just get them to fill out a sheet, and some of them get, like, Oh man, you want to know what inspires my music? What the fuck? And I'm like, are you <laughs> like, I need to know 
why'd you write those lyrics? You know, what's the in-depth story behind this? And why are you writing your riffs like this? You know, everything has a story, Jesus. But mm. uh, I agree with Jesse, like bands uh, uh, right now, a lot of bands have, have taken control of content creation and that's what they should have been doing before COVID stuff anyways. But it's kind of like kicked them in the ass, like, oh shit, man. Like we, you need to just be more than just like, here's my single, here's my album, look at me, buy it, da da da. You gotta show them the other side of you and other interests and stuff and, you know, secondary to primary and just funnel it all, right? Um, I found that like, that that's what bands should be doing. Like that's, that also it, it helps with the engagement on, on that level with fans. Like, oh, he's also, they're also like interested in that too. That's cool, you know? It's great. I like going to shows and and meeting bands and stuff and like talking something besides music, like comedy or movies or hockey or whatever. Uh, the artists, the, especially the well-known artists, they love that shit because it's not the same old crap every day, right? Mm. So, but bands should be taking advantage of content creation all the time. The, like Jesse was saying with the TikTok thing, like get like get on it get creative there's no think outside the box there are no rules to follow really you know yeah. we're the age of social media social media in my opinion is the biggest influencer of all now right uh sad mm -hmm. to say in a sense because like the print magazines have lost their influence the radio has lost its influence as much and the online too like social media i find with the kids especially the teenagers they don't they don't fucking know what a print magazine is anymore. They don't know what a fucking CD is anymore. You know, they have their certain websites they like, but I find they're like glued. Like my personal experience is you take the Metro here in Montreal and it's like, it went before pandemic shit, it was like four or five in the afternoon. And it's the quietest subway I've ever taken because the kids are out of high school and they're just, they're not even talking. They're all just glued to their phones, listening to their shit on their headphones. And I'm like, that's it. It's all mobile targeting and getting on the fucking app, right? Mm. But it's got to be Thank full you. circle anyways, in my opinion, still. You got to. I'm not just saying all, all that. But full right. A lot of moving pieces and parts. Yeah. yeah. Ray, anything breaking through for you? I think like, you know, the I always like actually discounted podcasts for a long time. You know, I always thought podcasts were where the easiest thing to do, because it's almost lazy journalism, because you didn't have to transcribe it. But um, since the pandemic, I felt like, you know, po podcasts have really uh, picked up, like, you know, picked up the quality, you know, really, like, you know, really show a different, different, uh, like, you know, a different side of the artist. Um, and, and people are, you know, a lot of artists are really understanding how to sell themselves, as you guys were saying, you know, like, being able to, to talk about other things other than just the music. And, um, and I think, like, you know, podcasts have really, come into uh come like you know come to maturity like you know over the last few months and it's really fascinating to see how many really great podcasts are out there and how many are really getting gaining in popularity um mm -hmm. but but yeah i think like you know content creation really important as you guys were saying definitely um i'm the, I'm, I'm the opposite about uh about social media i kind of feel that um artists being too involved with social media can can be majorly uh, a detriment because i've seen a lot of artists shoot themselves in the foot by um by posting the wrong things and and uh, and saying things without really thinking about it strategically and that kind of stuff, um, but like you know, but yeah, I think like you know the um, I think like you know that interaction is is important and being able to see the artist talk about their own art and also about their hobbies and the things that they, that interest them is going to bring fans back again. You know, um, having the fans, the audience, know what these artists are about and what their personalities are like um, is one of the biggest selling qualities to building um, a career. You know, if, if, if you can actually have a fan engaged in who you are as as a person, they're going to want to find out what you're doing like after this album, you know, and and I think that's important. And I look, you know, like I love building fans of artists as opposed to just records, you know, um, mm. and I think podcasts are definitely a great way to do it. Mm. Well, I, I love that as a guy that has two podcasts right now. So thank you very much for that. 
Unfortunately, we've hit our uh, one hour time frame, and all these fellas are very busy individuals. So I won't keep you around for too much longer, but I do feel like it would be wrong to make you sit here and help me promote what we do at Hawks without giving you a chance to promote yourself. So we will take a second to do that in just a moment. But real quick, as a reminder for everybody, this series is brought to you by Holix.com. It's a promotional platform for people in the music industry to share music. All these guys use it. I use it too, but I also work there, so I'm a little bit biased. Outside of doing this live series, which we try to do about every two to three weeks, we also have a brand new podcast series called High Notes. It's a music recovery podcast where we talk to different musicians who have struggled with addiction in various ways and the paths to recovery that they take. The entire first season is just eight episodes and it's available now wherever you get music. We also have a job board and a really cool blog called Holix Daily. So you can please check that out, find your next career in music, and who knows, maybe appear on this panel one day in the future. Now, our next Holix Live event will be, I think, in September, most likely. We have one set up right now for September 17th. I can't say exactly who it's with just yet, but it will be an entire PR team taking over the show as one guest that has multiple people from the same company. It's very cool. It's very exciting. It's been in the works for a while, but I want to thank all these guys for being on the show and give them a chance to, you know, promote what they're working on right now, even though we've been talking about it quite a bit. So let's start back the way that we did in the first place with John. What do you have going on right now? What should people be listening to from Asher media relations? Boy, I'm looking at my wall of notes. Hold on. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Let's see. We got, we got Helium Prime. Uh, I'm working from, from a band from Sacramento. Helium Prime, they're doing their independent release. They used to be on AFM Records, so they're sci-fi power metal. Uh, and mm-hmm. they're, uh, they're dropping their new album in October 5th, Question Everything. Um, let's see, Anonymous, working Anonymous, who put out their, you know, their catalog of, they have 12 albums in English and French because they're Québécois, uh, but they put out their first Spanish album because uh, the guys in the band are actually Hispanic too. So it's interesting. So they're a trilingual band, which is very interesting to work with. Um, let's see. Ooh, too much going on. Usually I'm still plugging festivals and stuff uh, and tours. Uh, <laughs> Every Hour Kills. Um, I got this interesting project where uh, Earth, Yellow Sun, they're, a instru- they're like this crazy prog band uh, from Toronto. Mm-hmm. And they're celebrating five years uh, of their EP, The Infernal Machine, and they're redoing it with a virtual comic book. And you know, every two weeks, we're releasing uh, like a, a video, comic book video with it, right? Oh, that's cool. It's kind of cool because uh, it's to engage current fans who, who know them, and then to mm-hmm. create, it's creating content to get some new fans, right? As they work on new material after this, right? So that's it. I'm just like, just yeah it's usually just the same stuff man um album promos and singles right now um that's pretty much it um like yeah love it <laughs> well ray what do you have going on over there Rayby? we have way so we have way too much um a lot of things going on <laughs> alien ant farm are working on a new record that's going to come out in 2021 i believe um bauhaus got the goth godfathers are uh like had to cancel their tour, but they're rescheduling for 2021. Um, Best X, Mariel has a new EP out. Um, she used to be in the Candy Hearts um, and uh, and like, you know, really, really great indie pop, a complete different direction for her. people who know Candy Hearts and know like, you know, might not be expecting this. Um, we have Blitz Vega, which has um, Andy Work of the Smiths in the band and also uh, Cav of uh, the Happy Mondays. Um, they're working on a really big um, record right now, a really big single that has some big like UK superstars on it. We can't really quite announce who yet, but mm-hmm. let's say some of the, one of the people might be from um, might be one of the biggest football or football slash soccer players in the UK. Um, mm. uh, we have Diana Ross just put out a, a remix record that we're working. Um, we have this great post punk artist Crow Jane. Who sounds like Bjork meets um, Bjork meets uh, Susie Sue. Um, Cranberries, we just reissued No Need to Argue with 36 tracks, massive, massive um, reissue record like, you know, that we, we just put out. Engelbert Humperdinck is doing some more live streams. Uh, let's see, like, you know, there's so much going on. Um, 
We have Josie Cotton from the 80s. She's like, you know, really big from, uh, she was the big star in that movie, um, Valley Girl. She has, uh, she's, she's reissuing all of her records. Uh, Mary J. Blige just announced um, a reissue of her album, My Life, um, which is, which I think it's 24th anniversary or something. Uh, but yeah, I mean, tons of stuff going on. I mean, we're working with the Wu-Tang Clan, the, the, the kids of the, with the Wu-Tang Clan, um, and they have new records coming out. And then R.A., forgot people who love um, love hip hop, R.A. the Rugged Man has has new stuff out and he's mm-hmm. fucking phenomenal. But yeah, mm. that, so many more, but I won't bore you guys with everything else. No, it's great. I'll, I'll, I'll second the, the best XCP is, is fantastic. And, and I don't even know if you mentioned it, but you guys are working with this artist named Toby right now. That's, that's a really good introspective rapper. The, both those are EPs, oh, both fantastic. And uh can I, would, would you forget to mention? I wanted to really plug uh, Striker. They won the Juno earlier this year, which is like <clears throat> a Grammy, but they're putting out a beer. They put out a beer called Session Ale. So any Canadians watching, order the Striker yeah. Session Ale. That's it. <laughs> there you go. Love it. Love it. And Jesse, what is going on with the High Road Publicity family? Yeah. So, I mean, we have a ton of singles coming out over the next couple of months from a lot of emerging underground bands, of course. Um, the, the one big record we're working on right now is a, a Swiss band called um, uh, Give Me a Reason. Uh, they kind of like an all time low state champs, five second summer kind of pop punk vibe. Um, they worked with Blake mm-hmm. from, from um, uh, Old Weathery to produce it. Really cool music video they just shot. It was uh, shot in the uh, Super Candy Museum in Germany, which is like this really crazy, like Instagram worthy like museum of all these like, pink colors and shapes and stuff that you could take photos in. And they destroyed the place and shot a video in there. It's really cool. <laughs> um, yeah, other than that, you can follow me, of course, on TikTok and Instagram, all that stuff, just at Jesse Lee. Um, you can hit high road publicity on Instagram and Facebook as well. Uh, and that's the best way to keep up with all the music that we have coming out. Cause, you know, obviously we're promoting it all on the socials every time something comes out. Love it. I love it. And make sure you find Jesse on TikTok. He's out there doing his thing. And uh, one of our, one of our viewers today, Nicholas Mishko, he has 10 and eight management. He brought his management company to the world of TikTok. They're doing some very cool things. And I think that that's, I mean, I, I've kept you guys 10 minutes longer than I asked you for. I, I'm so thankful that you've been good spirits this whole time. I'm happy to see that you're all out there thriving, staying busy. Um, everyone watching, thank you for watching. And if you're watching this in the future, I'm sorry you missed out, but there will be more live events soon. So go to holixdaily.com, sign up for our newsletter, or just join Holix. And either way, you'll get notifications about all of our upcoming events. Um, gentlemen, thank you so much for being here today. I'll let you go back to your busy lives and probably talk to all of you individually in texts and emails after this, but thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> all right. Oh, that is the end of our, per, our, our event today, everybody. Thank you so much for being here and uh, enjoy your days. Stay safe and we'll talk to you all soon.